Hello and welcome to another edition of Islamabad Today on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Hamza Rifalistan. Today, we have a very special guest. He's a former Pakistani ambassador to the United States, and he's come up with an excellent compilation of Diplomatic Footprints. That is also the title of his book. So when we talk about this compilation, the important part about this book is that it is all about the reflection from a diplomatic perspective. Ambassador Azaz Chaudhary, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you for having me. So, sir, tell us about Diplomatic Footprint, your latest book, and what is it all about? Well, it is a memoir, um, and it has my story, but also the story of Pakistan, as I saw it, as well as the foreign policy of Pakistan. So, in that sense, it dovetails three stories. Uh, you know, uh, I I believe that we all, uh, you know, grow up, we all get educated. We find some livelihood, and then we uh, get old and 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 pass out and pass away. It's about that time that one thinks that how would I be remembered? And uh, so I thought I should be remembered by the book that I have left behind. This book is uh, uh, is for posterity, for uh, diplomats of the future, and of course uh, my own legacy. Okay, so, I mean, if we go into the content of the book and we tell, speak about, you know, your personal reflections, what are those two to three very, very important reflections that you feel need to be publicized more? I think we um, see Pakistan's uh, relationship with its um, important neighbor, India, um, as a saga of missed opportunities. And we have, I have since dealt with that subject, with the peace process between India and Pakistan. So I've spoken at length on how those opportunities arose, and then unfortunately they could never be cashed in, and we uh, we remain estranged uh, even today. And that's a that's not something good for Pakistan, not good for India, not good for the region. And so I think my book does contain those kind of lessons, which uh, hopefully future diplomats and future leaders leaders will pick and uh, and mend what we what we could not. Okay, so, I mean, I was going through your book just right now, and, you know, there, there are lots of passages with regard to your meetings with some very prominent state officials. And you have a meeting with President Barack Obama. You also have had uh, interactions with uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin. So uh, tell us a little bit about that interaction with President Barack Obama and what was it all about? Well, I happened to accompany the Prime Minister of Pakistan in both of these meetings. Mm -hmm. um, President Barack Obama is a man of sharp wits, and uh, he impressed me a lot. And I must say, uh, he remembered his talking points. He spoke what he must. And we responded, uh, you know, according to our own brief. My, my sense is that at that time, the Americans were keen uh, on finding some solution for the Afghanistan uh, crisis. And that's, that was the focus of the meeting with President uh, Barack Obama. We could not actually find a solution because uh, Americans had a very different perspective of, uh, of uh, dealing with that matter. They wanted a military victory, which was not uh, forthcoming. And we were more uh, for a political solution. But I must say, President Barack Obama is always very civil, always uh, uh, comes out uh, as a genuine, uh, sincere interlocutor. So I, I really enjoyed uh, uh, that that opportunity. With President Putin, again, a, a man of very sharp intellect, I, I would say, uh, we were in a meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which he was hosting. So as a host, he had spent the whole day uh, in the conference and holding bilateral, bilateral meetings with, with, with the heads of state and government. And our turn came something around 7.30 p.m. And it was at that time, uh, you know, one would be very tired and most of us were yawning. But I saw him very, very alert. And what surprised me was that he was uh, so alert that he listened to our prime minister's talking points, responded to each one of them, and then picked up his own notes and shuffled through them to see if he had missed any. And he had missed only one, and which he, when he, which he then narrated. So that shows the man uh, had enormous energy, uh, which, of course, uh, is working to his country's benefit. 
Okay, so when we talk about diplomacy, Ambassador, and diplomacy these days is all about ensuring that, you know, your narrative can actually go across. We have a world which is deeply polarized. You have the Ukraine crisis on one hand, obviously the aftershocks of the COVID-19 pandemic on the other. You also have this U.S.-China rivalry in the Asia-Pacific. Now, being, you know, in your shoes, for example, obviously uh, you're not the Pakistani ambassador to the United States anymore, but you were the former ambassador. What key diplomatic, you could say, um, tactic should have been used in general to try and defuse crises of such proportion? What, in your view, is the tactfulness of diplomacy that can actually be applied when the world is deeply polarized as it is today? Well, uh, my sense is that U.S. runs its foreign policy based on its interests. And uh, uh, honestly, tactics uh, uh, don't really work that much. The United States is not a monolith. As you know, it's a huge country. But there are different centers of power. Uh, executive led by the president is one. But then there is the U.S. Congress, which is all powerful, too. Um, then you have the uh, think tank community and the academia. And you have uh, um, media, very powerful media. So yeah. you have to engage um, all these centers of power in order to convince the people of the United States. And public opinion matters. Um, if, your, if the people of the United States can get convinced about your uh, narrative, then it helps uh, uh, to, you know, talk to the, to the executive. And my, my sense is that uh, for Pakistan, uh, the leverage that we had was peace, peace in Afghanistan. If we could have enabled the United States to attain peace in Afghanistan at that time, that was our leverage. But unfortunately, uh, as I indicated to you, there was a big difference of approach. The United States wanted a military victory, and Pakistan thought there was a political solution to, to that problem. Uh, and therefore, we, we went back and forth, and we couldn't really uh, find uh, a, a solution. Meanwhile, the public opinion within the U.S. was growing that why are we engaged in, in distant wars, uh, in such long, long wars, which are so expensive, and you saw that after Donald Trump, President Biden also followed suit and saw U.S. withdrawing its troops. Rather hurriedly, I must say. Okay. So when we talk about the shrewdness of diplomacy, it's also important to make sure that you also do not alienate even your adversaries, for that matter. We all know that Pakistan has this running, uh, you could say, uh, feud with India. We're not in a state of conflict as such. We haven't really fought any wars. But, you know, uh, India's annexation of Kashmir on one hand, and then obviously you've had uh, Pakistan retaliating with uh, calling out Indian illegal, uh, you know, occupied Jammu and Kashmir and the atrocities that have been committed over there. So when dealing with adversaries specifically, what do you think uh, should diplomats basically do to try and make sure that they can navigate uh, through, secure their national interests, and also make sure that the message is sent to the adversary as well? I think the primary job of any diplomat is to win friends, win friends for Pakistan in every even in the, uh, uh, the adversary country, Pakistan, uh, and there are many, many friends uh, that you can find in India because of uh, uh, historical links, because of familial links. We, uh, that should be our job. That should remain our primary task. But in addition to that, as the world has discovered that the economic linkages, the commercial linkages uh, have a much longer life uh, and act as a peace constituency between countries. Uh, in my view, I think Pakistan and India haven't really uh, fully explored uh, the value of uh, uh, trade as a as a peace constituency, as a lever of, uh, of peace. Um, we could not learn the lesson from Europe, which had seen centuries of bloodshed, but then they realized that it was trade uh, that would actually bind them together. Uh, and similarly, in ASEAN, too, people are discovering that they can overcome their differences if they engage in economic and commercial investments. I think Pakistan and India have been unfortunate that this never became a priority. As a result, we remain uh, uh, at loggerhead. Okay. All right. So when we talk about the United States in general, obviously, you served in Washington. Do you think that, you know, your reflections in your book would have been slightly different had you been dealing with the Donald Trump administration? Well, I was uh, actually, I presented my credentials to Donald Trump. And I, I must say that at that time, the relationship was uh, not really moving forward in the sense 
uh, that the government of the United States was contemplating um, withdrawal from Afghanistan, was also contemplating uh, building up India as a counterweight to China. And therefore, Pakistan wasn't, they, they weren't really sure how to deal with Pakistan. But the beauty in, uh, in dealing with the USA is that but <laughs> excuse me, while you have uh, uh, the executive uh, or the government-to-government -government relationship, there's a people-to-people -people relationship which also exists uh, in parallel. And that's very strong, actually. And my, it is my sense that um, while the G2G relationship has oscillated between highs and lows, uh, the P2P relationship has somehow survived and, and not only survived, but thrived. And, uh, you know, for uh, students of uh, Pakistan, the United States had been, is, and probably will be an attractive destination uh, for the IT professionals. Silicon Valley um, is something that they look forward to. For the traders of Pakistan, as you know, the United States uh, is, the, uh, is the largest trading partner of Pakistan. So there are a number of areas in which the U.S. and Pakistan have maintained people relationship that state even at that time when i was there so as a result while executive was so too uh, focused on afghanistan i took the opportunity to reach out to a number of think tanks and academia the university i think i traveled around uh, uh, the us and also met over 60 us senators and congressmen one 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 on one and i realized that um, the united states uh, and its legislators as well as its academia they're all open to arguments. They're open to uh, different viewpoints. And I think that is the beauty of U.S. foreign policy because it gets enriched from different perspectives. And so there is always a scope for countries to deal with the United States. And so it was the case when I was there in the U.S. Okay. So when we talk about, um, you know, uh, let, let's just generalize the topic. I mean, if we talk about some uncomfortable conversations that you might have had as, you know, mm -hmm. the Pakistan ambassador to the United States, were there any such conversations? Well, yes, there were plenty because you see, we were working sort of at cross purposes. Um, we would, the US would say that you have to force the Taliban um, to, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, make peace with Ashraf Ghani, mm -hmm. and he was the president then. And we would say that if we Push the Taliban beyond a point. Of course, they had families there. They had they would come to Pakistan. But bulk of the Taliban cadre was fighting, and it was in Afghanistan, not in Pakistan. But if we take them on through kinetic action or any pressures, then the the, the war will shift to Pakistan. Now, this was a, a a perspective that the you know officials, senior officials of the U.S. executive were not really ready to listen. And it was a bit frustrating because, in the first place, the whole global war on terror was not, not something of Pakistan's making. But we, you know, after a huge price, we won that war, that peace had prevailed. And now if we were to take on the Taliban on Pakistani soil, that would have meant another uh, war on terror uh, on Pakistani soil. So I think these were very difficult conversations to, to, to have there. Okay, so Ambassador Zaz, when we talk about Pakistan, strained relationship with Afghanistan. I mean, obviously, uh, being two neighbors, the relationship has been a state of flux for quite some time. Not much has changed with the Taliban assuming power in Kabul. There would be many who would argue in Islamabad that diplomacy should reign supreme. We should talk to the Taliban so that, you know, these uh, negative alpha elements are not exported into Pakistani territory. The other viewpoint is that uh, military action maybe within Afghanistan through hot pursuit to try and, you know, rid out the alpha elements would be a better strategy. In your view, what is the best way to deal with the Taliban government in Kabul? Well, we should stay engaged with Taliban. There are uh, we hear that there are different factions, from hardliners to pragmatic ones, and we need to de deal with all of them. And we have to persuade them that uh, that whipping up and mutual hostility is the, not in the interest of either country. Uh, that uh, TTP should not use the Afghan soil against Pakistan. They are. They are murdering and killing, un, you know, innocent uh, people of Pakistan. So I think we have got to stay engaged. What the government probably doesn't want to do now, and I think they are right in taking that decision. They don't want to talk to TTP. They want to talk to a Taliban government because that's the de facto government in Kabul. But they don't want to talk to TTP because TTP uh, 
uh, are simply uh, you know terrorists and uh, militants which we cannot accept and therefore uh, this is this is one way the other is the ideological component i think pakistan yeah. need to find ulemas and especially the ulemas under whom taliban were trained and they should be sent to engage with the, their counterparts in afghanistan to persuade the ideological leadership of, of the taliban uh, that it would be much better for both countries to uh, to be peaceful uh, to engage in commercial and economic interactions and rather than uh, letting the you know ttp dominate the agenda between the two countries there are a number of other areas where we could persuade the taliban because they also need some kind of economic security so the regional projects for instance are very very important mm -hmm. and taliban could come around to tapi and to kasa 1000 and other regional projects which will benefit them too unfortunately what i see is that on three counts um, the taliban are just not relenting uh, they are not forming an inclusive government which the international community expects them to do they are not uh respecting the right of girls to education <laughs> and they are also not allowing uh, uh you know militants they are not stopping the militants preventing the militants from using their soil um, for uh, terrorism abroad so i think uh, recently there was a, a moscow format consultation held in yeah. which all the regional countries the neighboring and the near neighbors of afghanistan were and they were all uh, sending with the resounding message to the taliban that you need to listen to uh, what the world is saying and you need to rise up to these expectations that the world has and if that happens i'm glad that that pakistan was part of these consultations uh, then my sense is that uh, the taliban would uh, you know get due recognition uh, of their former recognition of their government they can also engage uh, with the rest of the world maybe grounds can be paved to lift Uh, 1267 sanctions uh, on them uh, yes. maybe us would on freeze the assets and so on and so forth but things must begin with, first of all with the taliban honoring the three commitments that i just mentioned mm -hmm. absolutely and those three commitments are pretty much non negotiable when we talk about the taliban actually getting into the mainstream there's this argument from master azaz that the economy uh, the more economically strong that you are the more bargaining power you basically have Now, when we talk about India and the fact that you know it's gotten away with border and Kashmir to a large extent, you know, with uh, Indian illegal occupation of Jammu and Kashmir and revocation of Article 370, there'd be those who would argue that had Pakistan been in, on a stronger footing, I mean, we've had a principal stance at the UN. We've also had a principal stance whenever we've dealt with so many of these Western countries to try and highlight the Indian atrocities which are being committed in Kashmir. But had we had a stronger economy, we could have bargained far better. I mean, this is just a school of thought. It's not necessarily a school of thought I subscribe to. But do you believe that a stronger economy gives you more bargaining power in international diplomacy? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, if your economy is strong, your uh, foreign policy choices expand. And conversely, if your economy is not doing well, your foreign policy choices shrink. And that's what we have seen. You see, it was the same People's Republic of China until Deng Xiaoping came. the amount of relevance that china is doomed it was only after it gained that economic muscle and the same can be said about india too uh, since 1990 uh, india has done well on the economic front and today you can see that it's the fifth or sixth largest economy Fine so therefore work, yeah. i think it ma makes a lot of difference but when it when it comes to kashmir mm, uh, i think the people of pakistan uh, feel rather strongly that the people of uh, jammu and kashmir should have been given their right to self determination like the rest of uh, uh, you know british india and this is it is such a sad story that india has used enormous force to block that right to self determination now the indians say that since there is a uh, there is a an elected assembly which has, wants to stay with india but i think that is a violation for us the uh, violation of the un security council resolutions which want a un administered plebiscite in which people can vote freely so uh, uh, the people of pakistan have been attached to people of kashmir for centuries 
I mean, all their waters come this side, all their markets were on this side. And therefore, these uh, age-old uh, ties cannot be severed uh, so quickly. So people of Pakistan, no government in Pakistan can ever uh, not support the Kashmir cause, not support the right of the self-determination of for the people of the uh, Indian occupied Kashmir. However, that said, I also believe that there were genuine attempts made in the past, like 4.4 Mullah, which came close to finding some kind of solution with with which both countries could live. But ever since August 5, 2019, when um, Modi government has uh, abrogated the article of their constitution, which provided yeah. autonomy, Article 370, which provided autonomy to uh, the Kashmir, Kashmir state, and they have converted them into two union territories, I think a, a huge violation of the UN Security Council resolution has occurred because uh, these resolutions had called for no material change uh, in the disputed territory. And now we see that there are uh, other uh, projects like, uh, 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 you know, demographics are being changed by settling non-Kashmiris into the valley. We also see the Limitation Commission redrawing the constituencies in such a manner that the uh, in occupied Jammu and Kashmir will not be a, a Muslim majority area. I think that's something which is uh, uh, which is uh, underway at the moment, and people of Pakistan and people of Kashmir are naturally quite agitated about it. But it's a it's it's a matter of disappointment for the people of Pakistan that the world is not able to grant uh, that right to the people of Kashmir, what became available to most part of the world parts of the world, and because of the geostrategic and geopolitical interest that the world has. Uh, with India, India is not being pushed hard enough to honor uh, the commitments that it itself had made uh, under the UN Security Council resolution to provide that right to self-determination to the people of Kashmir. All right, so Ambassador Zad, uh, let's come to the U.S. Congress now. I mean, obviously the U.S. has the appropriations bill through which um, development assistance can actually be given to many different developing countries and strategic partners for that matter. Pakistan is not an exception to that rule. But we saw a lot of, you could say, polarization and divisiveness in the U.S. Congress, where there were attempts by Republican, uh, you could say, lawmakers, to try, representatives, to try and make sure they can bulldoze the appropriations bill as far as uh, sending funds to Pakistan is concerned. But it eventually did pass because of the Democrats actually having a hold of it. So when we talk about military assistance, you do see, uh, you know, quite a few uh, representatives being averse to assistance, U.S. assistance to Pakistan. In light of that. How do you see the future trajectory of U.S.-Pakistan relations? When President Barack Obama came, he changed gears and he said, all right, we want to uh, engage Pakistan um, to uh, support economic support, military support, and they came up with uh, what came to be known as KLB, you know, okay, the Lugan, uh, government Lugan. bill. And, and that was from 2009 to 2014. We were to receive $1.5 billion per year for a period of, period of five years. Of course, the actual amount disbursed was less than that. Uh, nevertheless, that was a time when uh, it was felt uh, by the U.S. that the aid can be um, an instrument to influence Pakistan's policy. My sense is and I, that even in the U.S. now, uh, this is coming uh, uh, you know, rather uh, to the fore, that uh, it is not necessary that uh, aid will deliver uh, to you what you want in terms of foreign policy objectives. There's a book by Robert uh, Hathaway, The Leverage Paradox. And he argues in that in that, that the, the country which is uh, receiving aid, uh, uh, the leverage that U.S. has on that country is proportional to the will of that country to be leveraged, which means that if a country doesn't want to be leveraged, it will not be leveraged, regardless of the amount right. of aid you give to them. So I think uh, in Pakistan, there was an expectation that since we were forced into the global war on terror, um, we should be uh, uh, assisted and with, with economic and military support because we had spent so much money. We wasted like $150 billion of economic uh, uh, losses we had suffered, then we had lost 70 to 80,000 lives. Uh, so it was, it was something that Pakistan, and frankly, had Pakistan not put in that kind of effort, Al-Qaeda would not have been decimated. It was Pakistan which basically 
did all uh, all the hard work in catching. But once the Al Qaeda was de decimated, uh, Americans shifted the goalpost towards Taliban, and that then that's a very different story. But yes, coming back to your question, yes, the aid, military aid, and 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 uh, economic aid has always been used by the U.S. and different countries as an instrument of their policy to influence the recipient countries. And same was the case in Pakistan. Okay. All right. So let's come back to your book now. Are there any other major takeaways that you feel uh, should actually be not only publicized, but something that could, you know, uh, many people who actually aspire to be diplomats or many people who have actually served as diplomats or are actually currently serving as diplomats can actually take away from this? Yeah. If you look at the epilogue of my book, it's pretty long, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I deliberately dealt with the questions. Uh, that I had come across uh, both in the U.S. And, and in Pakistan and elsewhere, uh, questions like, who makes Pakistan's foreign policy? Is it just the foreign office or somebody else? Why is Pakistan's hostility with India not having a way? Why are Pakistan and Afghanistan harboring such a deep mistrust and not being overcome? And uh, well, can Pakistan and China, uh, uh, you know, become so aligned closely that uh, we can counter together the uh, U.S.-India alignment. And things of this, uh, these are the questions that I had been facing. Uh, why was Osama bin Laden, for example, found in Pakistan yeah. and, and, uh, and in 2011? And these are some of the questions that I've tried to answer in that. And I think epilogue, in my view, is a, is a very critical part of my, uh, my book because it deals exactly with the questions that I, in fact, whenever I was in the U.S. think tanks, uh, I would take notes not on, of what is to be said and what I heard, but only of the questions being asked to me. And that those were the, exactly the questions that I tried to address in the effort. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's this view, Ambassador Azaz, that apparently Pakistan should be joining camp. I mean, there are lots of people. I mean, the official stance from the foreign office is that Pakistan is not going to be part of any bloc for that matter if they are blocks for that matter, because China does not believe in uh, creating blocks. The United States under the Biden administration apparently does. So in light of that, there is this view, which is a minority view, that Pakistan should decrease its reliance on the United States and actually join the China and Russia camp, for that matter. I mean, its participation in the SDO. There would be those who would argue, uh, such as yourself, I believe, that a multifaceted relationship with all different countries all across the world would actually benefit Pakistan to a large extent. Given Pakistan's experience with the U.S., which of the two do you think is the correct strategy as far as Pakistan's foreign policy? Well, just take, for example, hypothetically, mm -hmm. that we go to Chinese camp and, and announce that we have nothing to do with the U.S. Will you be willing to forego the $6 billion plus trade that you have with the United States and another $6.5 billion that you have with, with Europe? Will you be uh, willing to let your people uh, who are in the uh, IT business sever their links with the U.S. Uh, technology companies and so on and so forth? I think not. Absolutely. People will not like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let's hypothetically uh, take up whether we don't want to take up our, uh, you know, we don't want to go to the Chinese camp and we are in the U.S. camp. Can you afford to lose all the leverage that you have built with the Chinese. I mean, China is not only investing in CPAC, which it did at a time when Pakistan was going through the war on terror and nobody, no other country was willing to invest in Pakistan, but Chinese did that. So Chinese are also engaged in, in multiple other ways to um, assist Pakistan through Paris of Payment, but through also defense and economic relationship. It is my sense that nobody in his right mind in Pakistan would ever like to sever ties with China. So my sense is, uh, and you rightly guessed my position, that Pakistan should uh, pitch its relations with the U.S. and with China based on its own national economic interests. And that's why I maintain that it is always doable. And you know, the world is not going through the kind of Cold War that existed between the United States and USSR. At that time, the world was divided into camps. But today, the U.S. and China itself, themselves are, are engaged um, uh, in the economic, uh, you know, world as uh, world and as well as uh, 
they have their competition. So my sense is that there is absolutely no uh, benefit to Pakistan if we were to move into the camps that are still not apparent. It's not not there. Uh, the world uh, is now is, is basing its interest uh, as uh, as the as the main pivot on which they build their foreign policy. Look at India, for instance. Yep. Despite the fact that India has been chosen as a strategic partner of choice by the United States uh, in the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, India still was dealing uh, uh, with gainfully, actually, with, with Russia. Uh, and therefore, I think every country does that. So why should Pakistan uh, pursue its own econo- in, uh, national interest? And I would say national economic interest, because that's that's the real uh, benefit to Pakistan. Former Pakistani ambassador to the United States and author of Diplomatic Footprints, Ambassador Azaz Chaudhary, thank you so much for joining us. Sure. Thank you very much for having me. Very kind. So that's all that we have from Islamabad today on Think Tech Hawaii. You can follow us on our social media pages. Do provide us with your feedback. Until next time, take care. Mm-hmm.